I'm doing really well. It's nice to meet you. You as well. Do I understand you are, are in Chicago? I am in Chicago. Yes. That's the Chicago skyline. That's Adams and East. Adams and gotcha. State. East Adams and State. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I used to work really close to there so I can see the buildings and, and put it together. Yeah. We're actually in the process of moving to uh, Michigan and Monroe, taking okay. advantage of the commercial real estate market as it is. Awesome. That's very exciting. Go ahead and share my screen. All right, we'll give people time to join and then get started right at noon. Sounds good. How many participants do you think, Marcy? I don't know how many officially registered, but we have almost 40 right now, and hopefully more will, will keep coming in. Ah, great. Oh, I see. Yeah, I see 36. Good. Welcome, Ayana. Hello, how are you doing? Great. It's so good to see you and meet you virtually. We'll, we'll get started in just a moment. Yes, same here. Thank you. All right, welcome everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, we are so excited you're here and whether this is your first webinar or your third or potentially your second year to come back to a webinar, we hope that you get a lot out of it. My name is Mark. Marcy Donez, and I'm the Senior Director of the YAS Prize, and I'm just so happy to be in this space with all of you. My colleague Cassie is also on, and she will be supporting in the chat, and we'll get started. So today I'm excited to share more about the first tenet of our STOP acronym, which is sustainability. It's a really important principle that holds up all of the rest of them. And throughout our time, we hope to break down any misconceptions you might have, give you helpful information and some inspiration as you get started on your application. We also have three wonderful alumni joining us today. Heidi True from West Virginia Academy, Kelby Woodard from Krista Ray, and Ayana Verdi from the Verdi Eco School. And you'll hear more about what this principle means to all of them before we do questions and answers at the end. And we encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat right now. Who, you, who are you? Where are you calling in from? And then if you have questions, please use the Q&A feature in the webinar so that we can capture them and make sure that they're all answered before we, we end our time today. Okay, and we'll get started. So sustainability really truly looks different in every single state. 
This is the Parent Power Index, which is a tool that measures the extent to which each state has policies in place that put students ahead of systems, values the diversity and need of every single family, provides vital and accessible information, and then affords parents the ability to make decisions about how their kids are educated. These are last year's ratings. This year's ratings will be released in March, so be on the lookout for that soon. Um, and it's powered by the Center for Education Reform, which is under the umbrella of the YAS Center of Education. Depending on where you are located, you will think about sustainability differently um, because of the unique factors impacting your work. Um, and thinking through your unique context is critical to answering the sustainability question in the application holistically. It's also important to note that the YAS Prize is both sector agnostic and we fund organizations in every single state, no matter what your landscape looks like. My colleague Cassie will also drop in the link to the PPI website so you can take a look and explore your um, unique context and landscape. Sustainability um, also means a provider is able to exist and provide an excellent education to students and communities without using continual philanthropy, instead utilizing public dollars that fund entities where students are learning. Now, depending on the type of organization, this looks very different. And we're not expecting any applicant to be 100% sustainable, but what we do expect is progress. Um, the YAS Prize is an award, not a grant, and so it should be additional seed money to work towards a goal as a one-time investment rather than funding that you'll continue to need over time to keep your um, work moving. I have three past awardee examples to share of what this looks like in action across the different sectors. Capital Prep Schools is an awardee from uh, 2022. They're a network of public charter schools across New York and Connecticut that utilize public charter dollars allocated to their school. Now, Valiant Cross Academy, the 2023 YAS Prize winner, is an independent school operating in Alabama. And they take a multifaceted approach to fund their programs, including consistent philanthropy, scholarships from the Alabama Accountability Act, grants, and then a small portion of student paying tuition. They're also actively working towards establishing an endowment fund with a goal of long-term sustainability. Public schools like the Randolph Eastern School Corporation, which is an awardee from last year um, in Indiana, are receiving funding from local, state, and federal sources. So as we shared, it looks different depending on the sector you're in. Sustainability could also mean taking significant action on the local, state, or national level for funds to follow students. In this picture, you'll see Jose Suarez, the co-founder and CEO of Hope Branch Learning Academy, urging legislators to show support for a bill creating universal choice for all students in Florida, regardless of their income or ability. Hope Branch Learning Academy is a 2022 YAS Price semifinalist and is a private institution providing individualized education for neurodivergent learners. Sustainability can also be generated by creating innovative revenue streams to decrease their reliance on philanthropy, such as sales of products or services. If you're in ed tech, sustainability looks like demand. If there are schools and families willing to pay for your service, then you have sustainable revenue streams. G-Star School for the Arts, which is a 2023 um, awardee has a green screen and studio in their school that Hollywood actors and actresses use. And that studio's revenue helps support the school. So that was just a little bit of an overview of how we think about sustainability at the YAS Prize. And um, before we get into the panel, which is the most exciting part of our time together today, I wanted to overview a few key um, pieces of information that are also available on the YAS Prize. My colleague Cassie will drop the link into the chat as well. Um, our application deadline is April 18th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and there will be no extensions. So we very much encourage everyone to apply um, and submit their application before that date, just to avoid any tech issues. As we know, they always come up. Um, our second annual um, YAS Summit will be in New York City on 12, September 12th. And before that, we'll also announce the 50 semi semifinalists on September 5th via a live stream. 
All of our semifinalists will attend the YAS Prize Accelerator in Miami the week of October 14th to engage in development, build their network, and deliver their three-minute pitch, which is very exciting and, and fun to see. Um, and then the 2024 finalists and the $1 million YAS Prize winner will be announced at the gala on November 7th in Washington, D.C. Um, for awardees, it is mandatory to attend the Summit Accelerator and Gala, and all of those key dates are in the application. So make sure when you get there, you put them in your calendar just so you know if you are an awardee, you have them already set aside. Okay. Now for the panel, this is the most exciting part of the webinar, because while I can talk about what sustainability means in theory um, and give you examples from the past, our three awardees that are here with us today are living and breathing it. And so I'm so excited to hear their perspectives. They all have different perspectives because they work in three different organizations across very different contexts. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Okay. Um, I'm so excited to have you all here. Thank you for being with us. Um, you are truly redefining what it looks like for K-12 education. Um, and we're excited to focus on sustainability today. So I want to spend the next 15 to 20 minutes with each of you talking about that. But to get started, I would love for each of you to give a one minute overview of who you are, where you work, and what you do. Um, we'll start with Kelby and then go to Ayana and Heidi. Great. Thanks, Marcy. I'm Kelby Woodard. I'm the president and CEO of the Crystal Ray Network. Uh, Crystal Ray is a network of 40 high schools in 25 states. Uh, we are Catholic high schools that are completely focused on a college prep curriculum um, and entirely dedicated to students coming from uh, families at the lowest economic quartile in the country. Um, we have a unique uh, sustainability model where our students work in white collar environments, um, and that uh, funds uh, 40 to 50 percent of a school's operation is uh, our students actually working in those environments. Awesome. I was so entranced, Kelby. I was listening to you. I didn't realize that minute was my turn. <laughs> Yeah, my name is Ayana Verdi. I'm sorry. It's been a while since I've seen you. Uh, my name is Ayana Verdi. I'm the founder of Verdi Eco School. We are a place and project-based urban farm school in Melbourne, Florida. We're the only school of our kind in our region. Uh, we use the community as a campus for students to acknowledge that learning doesn't just happen in a classroom very similar to Crystal Ray's work. Our students are out in the community completing internships, apprenticeships, in addition to building partnerships with other not-for-profits and schools to take learning outside of our campus um, and create some impact in our community. And I am Heidi True. I apologize, I'm on the road today, but um, I am the executive director and co-founder of West Virginia Academy. We are a charter school. We're actually the first charter school in West Virginia. Um, we service students from pre-K all the way up to 10th grade. We plan to add 11th and 12th. So give us two years and we'll be the whole gambit. Um, we are a classic instit classical institution Monday through Thursday, but then we have that experimental um, aspect on Fridays, which makes us unique. So that's us. Awesome. Thank you all for introducing yourself. Um, I'll, I'll hop into it then. And Heidi, maybe we'll start with you this time. Um, what questions should an applicant ask themselves to better understand their organization's current level of sustainability? So for us, right, you all have different funding streams. And so the main thing is getting that across. Um, whether it be for us, uh, we are federally funded, right? We are a public charter school. And so the money automatically comes in, but it also is based on the number of students. So for us, sustainability does inc include the number of students that we have and our trajectories going forward. Um, we need to make sure that, you know, we're not going to drop down. We need to make sure that our, um, you know, we're keeping up with our programs and such that we can sustain an increase in students. So please keep that in mind if you are federally funded. Um, and then I think the other thing is the uniqueness, you know, the unique factor. Um, for us, we do have an ESA. It's called a Hope Scholarship in, in West Virginia. And we are tied to providing courses for homeschool students through that program. 
So we offer some of our half day programs, we offer classes, and that brings students in from the community. It increases the number we get, and then they are privately paid through a different arm of our organization. <clears throat> so that makes a unique kind of sustainable action in that sense. Um, and then, of course, you got to remember all of your little programs, right? Your before and after school, your um, we've got midterm breaks because we do uh, year round. Um, anything that has to do with those extra lunches. I know that's really silly, but even those little extra things that you do, bring those in. Make sure that you're including those in your numbers. Thanks, Heidi. Um, Kelby or Ayana, do y'all want to add in from your perspective too? Like what do you think a, a applicant should ask themselves to better understand their organization's current level of sustainability? Shall well, I go first? It's Kelby. Yeah, please do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I I think that it's really important to ensure that you're thinking of diversity in your revenue streams, um, ensuring that you're not completely reliant on any singular source of funding to sustain your organization. So for our school, uh, as a micro school, we have to be really creative about where our funding comes from. We're nonprofit, independent. Um, we do accept uh, scholarships. So Florida state sponsored scholarships, about 50% of our students attend on scholarships. 50% um, of our students are private pay. We also have entrepreneurial endeavors that our students start. So for instance, we have an on-campus vacation rental in Airbnb. Um, so individuals can come and rent that, stay on the farm, learn about the incredible work that our students are doing. And that that uh, is a separate revenue stream. We're also able to apply for tourism funding from the state of Florida. Um, we do that by, again, creating a bit of an agricultural, agritourism interest on our campus. People can come for tours. They can come for cooking classes. So we chose to come at it from a perspective of what's really unique about us, what's really unique about our community, and how can we excite people and excite the state <laughs> in order to apply for our that public funding too, to sustain our school. Um, but we also encourage our students to think really innovatively, what can you support as a student that can support your school, but also maybe put some dollars in your pocket too. So whenever you give a student the opportunity to make some money for their future, they're really, really motivated to do some really incredible things. Um, our students are also creating a harvest to table eatery they call it waffly good, so they'll be making waffles. Um, but just really, really continue to be creative and not relying over much on one single source of funding is what I think is important to take away. Well, I'll take that as a lesson of not letting you go before me because that was a fantastic answer. Uh, diversity is the answer, uh, in my opinion. So I'll, I'll go to the second best, which is adaptability. Uh, so for us, you know, with 40 schools in 25 states, not every state we operate in has school choice. So the ability for us to um, have an adaptable model that says it will work in all kinds of environments is really, really important. Um, and so uh, even within that model, so if you look 28 years ago when the first Chris Array school opened in Chicago, the whole concept was about sustainability. It was about opening a college prep school in a community that's been closing Catholic high schools um, because families in those areas couldn't afford tuition. And so we had to come up with a new model if we were actually going to, to be able to fulfill that mission. That model is much different today uh, than it was 28 years ago when we sent kids into the workplace. At that point, they were uh, working at law firms and, and filing briefs and doing all kinds of, of things that do not happen in 2024. So we've had to adapt that model um, for 13,000 current students at Christo Ray across the country. Um, and one way we do that is um, by understanding that the gig economy is something that our students are interested in. So um, uh, similar to Ayana, you talking about some of the unique things you're doing, we are now creating uh, you know, marketing uh, consulting firms that our students are working uh, at doing marketing projects for companies. So adaptability is really, really important because the environment will change um, in the next two, three, four, five, ten 10 years. Um, just uh, Google AI and see how well, how much uh, the world's going to change for us. It's really helpful to hear the different ways y'all are thinking about that and, and putting those things in practice in your own organizations. 
um, thinking about the diversity of revenue streams, but that, that adds adaptability as well. Um, my second question, and, and any of you can get us started here, so I'll let you choose. Um, Kelby, since you said you didn't want to go after Ayan after that question, um, what are you working on at this very moment in your own organization and to become more sustainable? And then how does advocacy fit into the work you're doing to become more sustainable? Yeah, I'll start with the advocacy piece of that, because I think that is really critical and, and something um, that Yaz is, is uh, really encourages applicants to be a part of. Right. So just last week, uh, we were at uh, a convening in Washington, D.C., where uh, Yaz uh, provided us access to eight different governors at the uh, National Governors Association meeting. Uh, unique access to those governors to talk about school choice in their markets or in their states, as well as things that we want them to do um, to change it and make it more accessible. Uh, so what a great way for us to advocate for one of the key points of sustainability, which is school choice. Um, the second piece of that is, you know, how we've uh, really kind of adapted uh, that model, what we're working on right now. Um, it really boils down to uh, when 50% of your uh, revenue is is debt is is coming from one particular area like our work study program, and you've gone through the world has gone through three years of COVID, and is now on the other side of that, and the corporate world is uh, completely different than it was three years ago. We've really had to rethink our model, uh, but in doing that, we have have really doubled down on the core pieces of what that is, which is the experience for the students, um, and key to that experience is that our students are actually involved in a, a team effort at a corporation that is actually making a difference at that company, right? It's not an internship from a standpoint of um, shadowing somebody for the day. It is truly earning uh, tuition, which which is a much, uh, which, which does a lot to the psyche of our students, right? Of, of the fact that they've earned that. Um, so keeping that as, as the core, what we do within that is much different. So healthcare is a big area for us. So more spending more and more time talking to healthcare about embedding our students in their diversity pipeline and their talent pipelines, um, talking to uh, some of the gig economy that I mentioned uh, before. We also, um, and then I'll close this out, but uh, we're also uh, creating a fund, an investment fund that our students can actually manage. And what that investment fund uh, pushes off actually will be uh, going towards their tuition. So there's all kinds of unique ways to, to look at um, your revenue streams. All right, Ayana, do you want me to go? Um, so I'll give a couple things when it comes to advocacy. I would say this really, this whole process has really opened my eyes to becoming friends with legislators and really getting yourself out there, going down, meeting people. Just as Kelby said, you know, I would never have thought a year and a half ago that I would be meeting with governors and talking to them about these things, but you know what? It needs to happen. And the more we open our mouths, the more that we talk to individuals that are in positions to uh, change things and to, you know, change revenue streams. Right now we're discussing for West Virginia, um, we're looking at getting money in charter schools for buildings. And that's a really big thing for us. And so going down and advocating for it, um, making sure that you are creating those those gateways and those doors opening is is critical. The other thing that I would say is as you um, as you get involved with this, be open <clears throat> to other streams. Be open. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. What I would say is make sure that you're talking to everyone around you. Make as many connections as you can. Kelby mentioned, you know, that he's doing this work, um, you know, the internships and things like that. We're starting 11th grade next year and I am picking his brain, right? Like no other going, ooh, I want to get our kids out there. How can we integrate that? And so I think for us, we are really focused on our 11th and 12th graders and using those models that have been done before in Cristo Ray, in some of these other schools that are doing you know, similar work that you are, connect with them, get those connections. That works with advocacy. It also works with sustainability because you're doing unique things in your area that others have been doing and are proven. So that's, that's my two cents. Yeah, I would jump right on that, that train to say, 
uh, building your network and connecting to other schools, not even necessarily that are doing the same work as you, uh, because they're strength in numbers, right? And legislators are way more likely to hear you and listen to you when your voice is bigger versus singular. Uh, so there are other YAS Prize awardees here in Florida that have kind of banded together. They've created the Innovative Educators Network. They're hosting conferences. And the power of that, even just standing in that room and listening to those journeys is incredible. And legislators are sitting in those environments too and they're listening. So it's super important to do that work by being present. Um, as a really small school, I, I think before my YAS experience, I tended to um, avoid those conversations outside of my local community um, because I did not believe it would make a difference being such a small school. Um, but I've since come to realize that legislators are looking for opportunities to listen to really innovative ideas, even if they're operating at you know a lab school level, because something that feels small to you and your environment may be a really big shift and change for a larger system. Um, and legislators are excited to think about those ideas. Uh, so we've had an opportunity to speak to local legislators about how we use surplus buildings in our public school district. So we have buildings that are just sitting that are not being used that could be used to serve children in our community. Why are we not using those buildings <laughs> and offering nonprofits that serve children the opportunity to get in there and give space to kids who need it? Um, and if I hadn't been part of that conversation, I would not have been able um, to influence some new choices that may be coming up in our local school district. Um, it's also important for us to continue to consider as a really small organization how we continue to think about our legacy years down the line. So we're constantly being um, wanting to be concerned with, are we sustainable enough? Have we really considered all that we can do? Um, so we have also reached out to a, a couple of local community credit unions who are really excited about setting up a bank on our school campus. And it goes really well in line with the entrepreneurial endeavors that our students are starting. Um, and we got the idea from visiting a local high school that had an ATM in their, in their cafeteria and said, you know, how cool would it be if we made a partnership with a credit union who could bring the bank to our school? And so they'll come up and, and set up a, the bank in an office on our community campus once or twice a month. And our students have that access in an unprecedented way. So it just, it keeps the innovation for our students alive and it continues these partnerships um, that will lend themselves to sustaining our organization in the long run. Thank you for sharing all the perspectives on that. And Ayana, you started to get to this next question that I'm going to ask. And so you might want to build on it or someone else can start. Um, but what impact does becoming more sustainable and always thinking about, are we sustainable enough? How can we be more sustainable? How does the impact of being sustainable affect your organization? Yeah, sure. I'll start with that one. I, the interesting piece here for me is that our school was founded based on my desire as a parent to create a joyful place for my son to learn. I had no designs truly on having this lasting vision that would impact my community beyond my family. I said, it would be wonderful if I could create a space where my son could go to school and be happy. And from that, I built a family that built a community that shifted how my place envisions education. And I had to reckon with the idea that, hey, this is not just about your family or your son anymore. You're changing lives. Who will go on to change lives and who will hopefully go on to change more lives? So I needed to start to think about the work that we do outside of our local ecosystem and how the touches that we make can impact what school can be nationally. And it's very, very strange to think about the small school in Florida making changes that could create shifts in an entire system. But that's what we're doing. The conversations that we're having, the, the innovative philosophies that we're testing, we've created opportunities for larger systems to say that worked there at that school in Florida. I want to train my teachers to do that. And then we've changed the lives of students who will go on to say, 
hey, if I hadn't gone to a Crystal Ray, if I hadn't gone to WVA, if I hadn't gone to VES, my life would not be this way. We need these schools in our community. So this is now generational, right? So we're building a legacy. So it can't go away in two years or three years or four years. I have to think about how can this be here for my grandchildren? You know, so starting to think outside of who I can touch physically and thinking about, you know, three, four, five, six degrees of separation is is where I'm thinking about sustainability at this point. <laughs> right. I would add to that, you need to live in a place where you can do a Zoom call from outside. Uh, it's 23 degrees here in Chicago, which, you know, uh, you definitely have the better deal, Ayana. Um, I thought you would enjoy that. I, I appreciate it. Um, so here's what I would add. I, I think that's exactly right. Uh, what we find is that, to no surprise to anybody on this call, it actually changes the community that our schools are in, right? So when our first school was started in the Pilsen neighborhood of Chicago, um, lots of gangs, really high crime, and high rates of poverty, which is why we we went there. Um, today, if you go into the Pilsen neighborhood, a lot of our students in that school come from outside that neighborhood because that neighborhood has changed so much. And it's uh, we, we certainly take some credit for that. And our alums come back, serve on our boards. They're changing lives. And in fact, having them on our boards is really interesting because uh, sometimes you'll get a, a Chris Ray board that starts talking about, well, maybe this whole work study thing, uh, it's a lot easier to get somebody to write a check than it is to get them to uh, you know, have kids in their workplace. And the students, the alums, not students, the alums on those boards are the first to step up and, and talk about the experience and how important it is not to change that aspect of who we are. I would also uh, mention, I know Nancy uh, from uh, St. Philip and St. Augustine in Dallas is on as well. Um, and it reminded me of, of our school in Dallas. I was the founding president of Chris Ray Dallas. And we moved on to the old St. Augustine uh, campus, the old St. Augustine Catholic School, which allowed St. Philip and St. Augustine to become an academy. And what I would say is that even in that ecosystem of Pleasant Grove, uh, which is a, a part of Southeast Dallas, because of that, it, it gave high school opportunities. It was the first high school um, that was not a public high school, meaning no charter school, no charter high schools, and no private high schools were within 10 square miles of where Chris Ray Dallas started. It allowed for that academy to thrive because they had somewhere to send their students right? To go from eighth grade and into a high school that they could trust as well. And the same thing happened on the other end of that. And that neighborhood is changing. And it's uh, it's becoming uplifted by hope. And everybody on this call is involved in education reform because they want, or or an education period, because they want to provide an opportunity for hope. Um, and that's the transformative part of what you're doing. Yeah, and I would add to that as well. Um, we all exist to fill a niche, right? And it might not be for everyone, but there are students that thrive within your environment. And when it comes to sustainability, so we were the ones that had to charter through and really fight and convince everyone that we can stay. And we still fight today. We fight uh, to just you know, keep existing. And I would say the sustainability aspect, having that confidence, that confidence for our teachers, that confidence for the parents that say, no, we have funding, we're going to do just fine, even though there's a lot of noise. And there's a lot of people that are, um, you know, maybe on and off again, when it comes to what you're offering, it's okay, we're still going to be okay. And especially in a new organization, um, like ours, you know, you really having that confidence behind you really helps everything else and keeps that sustainability going. Once your families get in and they love it and they really can um, can tout it, right? That also increases the sustainability aspect. And um, I just, I echo the other two. Um, your students really do a lot of the advertising and the sustainability aspect. We have a lot of students that just love and parents that have really changed just in the little bit that we have been open. So I'll echo those. Thank y'all so much. Um, those were my three big questions for today. And I would invite y'all to stay on for the Q&A um, in case there are questions that y'all are uniquely positioned for and, and would have a better um, insight to than, than I would. Um, but we just appreciate your wisdom and insight so much. All right, let me hop in and take a look at the Q&A to see what questions have come up. 
Kyle Ellison asks, what advice would you have for a new school that is launching and truly hopes to be student guided and centered to focus on in the beginning stages? There are so many things to think about and should one focus on just launching the school and all that comes with that? Or is it better to think about the diverse revenue streams in the beginning? I will actually ask if any of you have a particular um, like piece of advice for Kyle. So I'm going to jump in really fast because it was my husband and I that started this about five years ago. And um, we opened our doors about a year and a half ago. So we're brand new. And I think the biggest thing is, I hate to say it, you got to focus on both. But um, having a strong program, having a strong ability to project that program to other people, especially since you're doing something so new to an area, um, exuding confidence, knowing what you're offering to that your area is critical to get people on board to buy into that vision and then as you talk to people those revenues and those those opportunities open up and so really focusing on what you want to do in that niche you fill then I'll tell you other doors open so that would be my um, advice to you is focus on having a really solid program and and curriculum student-centered whatever your idea is and being able to relay that to others Thanks, Heidi. I would agree with that and share. It's like, it's the both and um, making sure that one is really strong and you can't just forget the other one as well. So thank you for having in. Um, Anna Hurst asks, for charter schools that are publicly funded and have a history of sustainability and balancing budgets, is that story sufficient or does it need to dive deeper in into how we're making that happen? Um, what I would share is just being really clear and upfront with what you mean by um being like a history of sustainability, what has that looked like and, and how have you achieved that and what does it look like moving forward? How are you planning to continue to be sustainable um, even if things change in, in your climate? Um, and that can include, you know, advocating for, for policy and legislation that can include the ways that you're thinking about creative revenue streams, et cetera. So it, just make sure that you're really clear in the way that your, your organization is currently sustainable and how you're thinking about that moving forward. Mary Helen Franz asks, what specific legislation, le legislative time do you require or hope from your awardees? And is the focus on education freedom the only focus you hope for all um, legislative discussions? Um, our organization is for all youth and have no political or religious preference. Um, I'll ask my colleague Caroline to also hop in here in case there are pieces that I'm missing. One thing I would share is that the YAS Prize is not politically affiliated, and we do um, support education freedom and ensuring that all students and families have access to um, opportunity and choice in that. And so that is really what, what our particular prize is, is focused on. Caroline, would you add in anything there? Yeah, um, and good to see everyone. Uh, my name is Caroline. I'm the vice president of the YAS Prize. Thank you to Marcy, my colleague, who um, who is running this webinar um, so beautifully today. Uh, so there's nothing specifically that we require of our awardees regarding legislative time. Obviously, um, you know, as Heidi mentioned in her opening remarks, you know, she was, you know, you were the first charter school in West Virginia, and that required probably a lot of legislative push, but she's even doing more of that now um, with the support and backing of the YAS Prize. Um, but what Kelby and Heidi were referring to in terms of the DC opportunity was every January, February, there's a DC convening where a, a lot of governors come to DC and we get the opportunity to meet with them. Um, and so while that's not a mandatory component, a lot of our, our it's, it's open to our finalists and our winner. Um, and so eight out of 10 of them convened in DC last week. And it, what was really cool about it was we, you know, we submit to the governors, which governors we want to meet with based on certain states that are really open to education freedom and out of a lot of the other groups who are also submitting the YAS prize got an exceptional amount of governors to say yes, um, which just really proves the power of their stories and the power that governors want to hear from people on the ground. Kelby and Heidi, do you have anything to share? I mean, obviously you were probably talking about funding with governors, but what were some of those other conversations like, like in terms of, uh, you know, the breadth and depth, knowing that you spoke to so many of them? Kelby, do you want to start? Sure. Um, and one of the things we mentioned uh, when we were in D.C. with the eight of us is that at this point, I think we could give each other's pitch. 
Uh, so I'll give Heidi's pitch, right? Um, part of it is access to facilities for charter schools, right? Um, and facilities funding. Um, so there's a lot of, when you say education freedom, it's not just about the funding piece. It's about the ability to be permissionless, right? The, the ability to do what we know we want to do and can do for students um, and to have that freedom to do that. And there's a lot of different things that we talk to governors about. In fact, some of the governors we talked to or, you know, already had uh, school choice programs that were funding, um, you know, charter school systems and, and funding uh, private school scholarships. But there were other things that we wanted to talk to them about. And some of it was around things like career and technical training. Um, governors really responded well to uh, conversations uh, around that of what career and technical education looks like at the high school level in particular, but um, even um, in the middle schools and elementary schools. So there's a, you know, whatever it is you, you want to advocate for, the great thing about the Oz Prize is that it gives you access to people to talk about that. Tidy. Yeah, I would definitely echo that. And I would always, I would also say um, when it comes to a lot of them wanted to know specifics on how we were um, addressing maybe diversity. Um, you know, we talked a lot about the black and brown community and what the different organizations were doing to help them in their states. They even offered, which I loved this, they offered um, for us to go and speak in, you know, more in depth if the governor wanted. And so we're really open to sharing our stories, sharing maybe the trials that we've got, and then moving forward um, into the future together. And I think that's critical is, you know, that kind of that camaraderie. And while, you know, sometimes the states and the awardees didn't necessarily line up in terms of, uh, you know, there wasn't necessarily a, an awardee in the room from that state, depending on the governor, uh, it opened up their eyes to the, the complexity of what education looks like, that it doesn't just look like a school, it doesn't just look like an independent school or a charter school, um, but the YAS Prize really builds a uh, an amazing ecosystem and then a governor will look at an awardee and be like you need to be in my state and that happened last year uh to chris from oakmont education and a year later she is opening in iowa this september and so when you get a governor to look at you and be like you need to be in my state it happens very quickly um and so it's that exposure and awareness piece too in terms of educating governors on the fact that we're not just thinking about school as it was 20 years ago back to you Mark. Can yeah. I add five seconds to that? Because that, that was really, really well said. Um, you know, I, I had an opportunity to serve in the Minnesota House of Representatives in a previous life. And one of the things that you valued as a politician are really honest brokers, uh, people that will uh, that you can count on and trust um, in areas that you may know nothing about. And that was the that that probably is the number one outcome of uh, of what we did last week is to be seen as that trusted partner that uh, the staff of the governors can call and say, hey, we're thinking about this. What do you think? I mean, what is what is your perspective on that? Um, and that that is something that politicians really crave. I know that sounds a little unusual, but they want, you know, to be able to have trusted partners they can have conversations with about um, topics they're not really overly versed in. Thank you for all of those insights. Um, okay, I think we have one more question here. Um, someone asked, what types of non-school education organizations are not competitive for this opportunity? For example, an impactful education organization with demonstrated positive impacts that provide non-rostered and drop-in education programming for a specific vulnerable population. Um, okay, so let me make sure I understand this correctly. What types of non-school education organizations are not competitive? I could flip it and say like which types of non-school education organizations are competitive or are eligible for the YAS Prize. And I would really encourage you just to go on the very beginning of the application to look at what eligibility requirements are. If you were serving students in pre-K to 12 um, and providing a, a, a service for a very real felt need, um, that is one of the key things that we look for in thinking about what awardees um, are, are part of our cohort for the year. And so that's what I would share is that it is not sector specific. So we have schools, we have private schools, um, public schools, charter schools, micro schools. We also have ed tech organizations, um, um, nonprofits. So really across the board, I would encourage you just to go on to the YAS Prize um, website and look at our past awardees so you can see 
how that looks in different sectors and what that might look like for your particular organization, and then how they represent the four stop principles, sustainability, um, transformational, outstanding, and permissionless. And if you want to get more information about each of those principles, I really highly encourage you to come back to our upcoming webinar. So today we talked about su sustainability. But our next one's going to be about what it looks like to be transformational. And so I think that is probably the best um, advice I would give you to understand like what it looks like to be really competitive for the OS Prize. Okay, let's see. And then Tessa Kratz, uh, I think Caroline's answering your question right now about um, are you eligible? So I will let Caroline answer that. Um, and I will actually get us back to just a few final um, key things to close out with. Um, okay, let me share my screen. All right, and as we close out today, a few key reminders. One, um, apply. Apply by our deadline on April 18th. Do not wait for that day. You can go to yasprize.org um, to start your application. And then, like I just shared, register for our upcoming webinar. It's on Thursday, March 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And we're going to talk about what exactly is transformational in practice. Um, and if you can't make that one, but you still have questions, we host office hours every single Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You do not need to pre-register for that. You can just just show up and we are there to help answer your questions. I mean, we really try to do make sure every single person um, gets their questions answered during that time. So come to that. And then we have three minutes left. So I'll um, quickly ask our panelists, um, if you were to leave our applicants for this year with a piece of advice or encouragement, what would it be? All right, I'll take it, Kelby. You can think for a little bit. Um, I would say jump in with both feet and rat and enjoy every moment of it. Um, participate as much as you can. Be involved in all these things. I mean, I have learned so much just in this past year. Uh, the YAS organization does such a good job at bringing together networking as well as giving you the information that you need. So look for all of these and any of these that you can attend, um, go to them. That's what I would say. And I would just add to be really open-minded. This is not a grant. Um, and I know uh, Marcy started off by saying that this is, uh, this is part of, of joining like-minded people, like-minded in that um, everybody that's associated with the Oz Prize just wants to do unique, innovative, good things uh, for students. And uh, be open-minded about this process because it is different than any process you'll ever be a part of. And if you, uh, that you ever have been a part of, I should say, and that if you keep an open mind, uh, you really will uh, learn a lot and it is truly transformative for you as well. Yeah, I would just round that out with saying, be authentically you. Your passion and your purpose is what has brought you to this point. Uh, the YAS organization would love to see that <laughs> in your application and when you show up, your presence, um, share what you're excited about, share what you love, tell your story. Um, other people want to hear it. What you're doing is great. And we appreciate you. We're glad you're here. I'm so excited to learn about everybody who applies. This network has been transformational for me. Uh, so I hope it will be for you too. Thank y'all so much. I'll ask the three of you to stay on for just a second so we can get a quick picture. Um, but that is the end of our time. Thank you for being here. Um, we will send out a recording to all registered um, people so you can see that coming as well. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a quick photo before y'all hop off so that we get a good picture instead of um, whatever screen grab <laughs> we would have gotten otherwise. Let me pull this up. All right, and one, two, three. Awesome. I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for being here with us. Right. Thank you, Marcy. See you guys. Good seeing you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye.